Birds today are the masters of the skies. But they were not the first creatures to fly. And they are certainly not the biggest. The first large animals to leave the ground were so extraordinary, they're almost beyond imagination. variety of species. Some the size of aeroplanes were the largest creatures ever to fly. They could travel halfway around the world in a single flight. And the pterosaur's extraordinary abilities enabled them to dominate the skies of the prehistoric Earth for 150 million years. But why did these magnificent beasts take to the air in the first place? How did they fly? And why, after such success, did they vanish? Something very remarkable happened around 220 million years ago. The planet then was a very different place. It was much drier for a start, but in the tropics there were rainforests. And then, as now, they were the focus of a great deal of varied wildlife. In the detail, however, they were very different. Most notably, there were no large creatures in the air, no bats, no birds. The stage was set for a remarkable advance in the history of life. At that time, the only animals that could fly were insects. They were tempting food for reptiles. But if a reptile were to catch them, it too would have to take to the air. And a hint of how they might first have done so can be seen in an animal that is alive today. This little lizard, called Draco, it's found throughout the forests of Southeast Asia. And it must certainly have had in the far distant past lizard ancestors and cousins that looked very much like it. Like them, it finds its food, insects, throughout the forest. And to do that, it has to get around. And it has a very interesting way of doing that. Draco is an excellent climber. Light in weight and with powerful gripping claws, it can run along the branches of the highest trees in pursuit of its prey. But Draco faces a problem. How can it travel from one tree to the next without going all the way back down to the ground and then up again? 
The way it has evolved in doing so gives us a clue as to how early reptiles may first have taken to the air. It jumps. But it does more than just leap. It extends the width of its body by opening flaps of skin along its flanks. And they enable it to glide. Draco may give us the right idea as to how gliding, flying amongst the reptiles started. But one thing is certain, flapping flight, powered flight, remained the preserve of the insects for a very long time. And then one group of reptiles developed even that. And the evidence of how they did so is really very intriguing. This is Dorset, on England's south coast. And this is where my journey into the past begins. A 90-mile stretch of shoreline here can tell us a lot about the evolution of flight. This is the Jurassic Coast. Its rocks are full of fossils of prehistoric creatures, including evidence of the first backboned animals ever to fly. But it wasn't until the 19th century that scientists started putting together those clues to form a detailed picture of one of the most dramatic periods in the whole of the history of life. And they had an unlikely ally, a middle-aged woman from the local town, who used to come out to scour these cliffs for those clues. She'd come in all weathers, but particularly after there had been heavy storms which might have removed some section of the cliff and so exposed specimens that no one had ever seen before. Her name was Mary Annie. Mary is, for me, the heroine of this remarkable story. She had an almost unbelievable talent for unearthing fossils. In the early 1800s, science was still the preserve of men. Yet what she managed to unearth brought academics flocking to her hometown of Lyme Regis. So extraordinary were her achievements that some called her the princess of paleontology. When you consider Mary Anning's status, a woman from a working class background with no formal education to speak of, it may seem strange that she acquired such a prestigious reputation. Until, that is, you see what it was she discovered. <laughs> 